shouting now for the benefit of the people that have got uh, their speakers on. So welcome to day two of Innovation Zero's Finance Forum. We've got some excellent panels here for you today. My name is Gemma Gathercold and I'm a Strategic Engagement Lead with ACCA and we're partnering with Innovation Zero for this forum. And I'm delighted to be your chair for today. So I will be popping up at the beginning of each session to introduce the people that are speaking. At ACCA, we're at the forefront of advocating for a better world through accountancy, demonstrating the profession's ability to lead in addressing the world's most pressing issues. This year, our organisation's agenda for action focused on three pivotal areas, sustainability, artificial intelligence and talent. So we're delighted to be able to chair today on the Finance Forum with so many great topics in the sustainability and green space. As you will no doubt be aware, sustainability and how we meet the net zero challenge is a hot topic for businesses of all sizes, for public sector and for policymakers everywhere. And I'm sure as you're all here today, I don't need to convince you of the need for us to act soon. John Lelliot, OBE, chair of ACCA's Sustainability Global Forum, said change or die has a very literal application when it comes to sustainability. Unless the world addresses climate change climate challenge successfully, there may be simply no habitable world left. So if we're to avoid climate catastrophe, the world must change and organisations need to adapt to a more sustainable future. We have on your seats today a card from Ideonomy. Um, you can engage with the, the debate through using the QR code on that, that card. Um, we also have Slido for use for our questions today, although unfortunately our first speaker doesn't have uh, doesn't have time to take questions, but we do have questions for all of our panels. So our Slido link, oh sorry, first, yeah, so join the conversation. This is our Slido link. We'll have this up for each of the panels where you can participate in the questions. And use this QR code to redeem your CPD points for today's event if you are claiming those. We'll leave that up for just a moment. And I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker for today, Kerry McCarthy MP, who is the Shadow Minister for Climate Change. And she's going to be giving her keynote address on leveraging UK competitive advantages for crowding green investment. Kerry, welcome. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that introduction, Gemma. And um, as I said, I'm sorry I can't stay with you today. Um, we've got very important local elections in Bristol tomorrow. We're up against the Greens, and um, I've got to get back to Bristol from Paddington as quickly as I can. Um, in terms of the, the topic for today's session, um, I, I just would say actually in terms of questions, I think Ed Miliband is doing uh, a Q&A session later on and he's my boss and he has all the answers, so uh, at least you'll be able to hear from him. Um, in terms of the, the topic for today, I'm, I'm sure that many of you will agree that the UK is in a unique position in terms of climate adaptation, in terms of the competitive advantages that we've got. And central to that from a Labour point of view is the ambition to be uh, clean power by 2030. And we absolutely know that that is ambitious. But if you don't set ambitious targets, then um, I mean, well, it's imperative that we act as quickly as possible. It's imperative that we do as much as possible on net zero in the early years rather than, you know, in the, in the later decades um, leading up to 2050. It'll be very much about the hard to decarbonise sector. So I think it's important that we do push ourselves with that ambitious target and the government's target is 95% by 2030. So we're not that different. I am under strict instructions not to be party political, um, but I, so I would just very gently say that, the, that what has happened in, in the last year or so, which is perceived um, by many as backtracking on climate commitments, has not been helpful in terms of attracting investment. And I will um, quote my former Tory neighbour, Chris Skidmore, who of course was the government's net zero czar, did incredibly good work with the net zero review. And he talked about the four C's which um, investors need, certainty, clarity, consistency and continuity. And that is very much echoed with the conversations that I have with businesses, investors, stakeholders and environmentalists about this. But the other two C's that frequently come up also are consensus and collaboration. They do want there to be cross-party working on this and I think we have demonstrated um, by trying to work with people like Chris um, uh, that we are, we are up for doing that sort of 
cross-party working. I think there's been an unhelpful narrative that is sometimes being pushed that the cost of reaching net zero is too great or that it comes as a massive cost. And there are some people that say it's too expensive, we can't do it, um, and it's a reason to delay. Um, there are others actually who are very much environmentalists, want to get to net zero, who I've heard saying, we will have to we have to pay the price of this because it's too co um you know it's in, it's the imperative to act to keep global warming down to 1.5 degrees means we've got to pay this price and i think both those narratives are wrong because actually i think as ed miliband said in his conference speech last year the costs of not acting are far greater than the costs of acting and we need to present that positive agenda that this is an opportunity it is not something that should be seen as a burden of course there will be costs associated with it but overall it's a massive opportunity for the uk to um, to become world leading and the partnership between public and private sector finance will be at the very heart of this the un global stock take highlighted that we need emissions to fall by 43 percent by 2030 but at the current um, rate of national determined contributions will only deliver a 2% reduction. And that is if um, the NDCs are fully implemented. We know that that's a very big if. We, ahead of, um, I, I'm obviously hoping that there will be a general election soon and that Labour will win that election, which could mean that we go straight into COP29 in Azerbaijan. It's, it's very unhelpful time. And if there's an October election and even more unhelpful time in given that there's an American election, um, with a possible change of leadership there as well. But we have COP29 then, and then we have the big COP, um, COP30 in Brazil um, the following year. And I think ahead of that, what we need to do um, in terms of those two major challenges, one is to raise ambition with improved um, pledges to reduce emissions, and we will have to be uh, drawing up another carbon budget, but also revised NDCs fairly soon. And then it's about implementation, delivering on current and more ambitious commitments. I want us to be in a position where Britain um, is seen as a climate leader domestically and internationally again. And it's about sending out the strongest possible message to the rest of the world and setting a path for others to follow. I was in Dubai briefly um, in December, and it's a little bit disheartening that they feel that we've stepped away from that kind of global leadership. But in, in terms of the, what advantages we have, of course, we're the first major economy to set a net zero emissions um, target into law, which has been emulated around the world. We have a world leading financial services industry that will play an absolutely central role in the transition to a net zero economy. Our universities attract international investment and as a research base provide a great starting point for innovation. And this feeds into a general sense of high quality and standards enforced by respected institutions like the Climate Change Committee. We have an open agile economy that is well placed to target our geographical advantages, such as our proximity to the Atlantic Ocean and capacity for wind generation, which should mean, you know, if we fully maximise the potential of that, will mean significant and sustained economic growth, raised productivity and increased exports. So if I I'm a Bristol MP, and just to give a couple of examples, we have the National Composite Centre, Catapult Centre, just outside Bristol, where they're doing incredibly good work um, in terms of um, wind turbine blades. Um, we've got a company called Vertical Aviation, which is looking to replace helicopters. Um, very much involved with the local um, innovative um, industries. We also have something called the City Leap Project, which I hope some of you will have heard about. And that was a challenge set down to us. Um, you'll know that many councils across the country have declared a climate emergency. And that started in Bristol, where it was an initiative by the, the now Green Party leader. And when you're presented with a challenge like that, we very much wanted to make it more than just a, a slogan, a declaration. You have to actually deliver on that. And you will know, again, I'm not being party political, but councils are generally not flush with money at the moment. So we looked to um, the private sector, and we've set up this 20-year project, City Leap, which is a partnership with Vattenfall, the um, Swedish state-owned energy company, and Labour very much wants to emulate with that with its GB Energy. Um, but with Amoresco as the private sector, um, partner that will see more than 400 million pounds invested in low carbon infrastructure over the next five years the co2 output of the city will be reduced by 140,000 tons thousands of homes will be retrofitted and over a thousand green jobs will have been created 
and we absolutely need to see that on a national scale. The government has, I think, is piloting um, to see whether it would work in York, but I'd like to see across the country that similar partnership where, yes, you will need public sector investment to take strategic stakes to de-risk some of the investment, but it is very much about leveraging in what people, whenever I meet them, tell me is trillions of pounds that is waiting to be invested, provided the conditions are right. And Ed Miliband talks about um, what he calls the four horsemen standing in the way of progress on net zero. There's the grid. Um, everybody will know that we have got to improve grid capacity and massively speed up connections to the grid if we are to get to, you're not going to get to clean power by 2030 at the current rate of grid connections. Um, the planning system, again, is pre always cited as a major obstacle to people um, making that green transition. Skills is a concern, and then there's investment. In terms of the investment, some of the things that I would say come up with me is, and this is a, a perennial concern, um, what um, innovators tend to call the valley of death. So we are very good um, at supporting companies up to the point of commercialization. We're good at R&D, as I mentioned, things like the, the, the catapults, the place like the National Composite Center. We are not so good when it comes to marketization of a product and ensuring that manufacturing and delivery is kept in the, the UK. Um, we will lose the chance for homegrown tech if this isn't dealt with. So we absolutely need a strategy to make sure to, to help those businesses do that. Um, one of the things we're looking at is whether to link to the offshore, uh, offshore wind as an example, the CFD, the auction round, what we in our slogans call the great British job bonus, but um, where we would support people that were helping to create jobs in the supply chain as part of that. I think it's... Um, we would say that demand side policy has been a weakness. Um, the UK government is better at the supply side push, but worse at incentivising demand for products. Um, one, one of the tools would be very much green in procurement, um, which we talk about a lot, but hasn't really been um, implemented. And there is an element of behaviour change in how you can nudge people along or make it easier. You know, EVs is a classic example of how you've got to try and develop an affordable second-hand market if people are going to go down that route. It's not just about the ZEV mandate and making car manufacturers produce the product. You've got to deal with demand as well. In terms of competing, the, the competition element, um, as I say, we've got real competitive advantages, but we've also seen our competitors really step up their game. And the, the big one, obviously, is the Inflation Reduction Act and what Joe Biden has done. Um, but the EU, with its Green Deal, is following suit. We need to look at how we can... We, we're not going to have the sort of money that Joe Biden's got to invest, but we need to be sure that we, where there is a need for public sector investment, um, we can help get certain projects off the ground. And I think that does come back to that sense of certainty, because, again, investors say to me, um, on, on those other issues, at the moment, if you're, if you're trying to set up a new product and you know you can get very swift grid connection, you can get some support from the government, you don't have to negotiate endless planning delays. Why would you come to the UK when you could actually get your project off the ground five years earlier, ten years earlier in another country? So we do have to deal with that. The green economy is already worth over 70 billion and supports um, 840,000 well-paid jobs in the, the UK, but as I've said, it's, it's a massive potential. And I would say we tend to talk about energy mostly, um, but if you look at the broader sustainability agenda, so the circular economy in particular, I think there's masses of jobs that to be made there, really exciting projects. Um, but again, it's, it's about turning those into mainstream rather than niche um, products. We do need to get the machinery of government right. We need to crack that problem with cross-departmental working on all these issues, whether it's skills, whether it's house building, whether it's transport, and uh, um, whether it's things that DEFRA are responsible for. And above all, Rachel Reeves has spoken about a green treasury being absolutely at the heart of it and creating the right green regulatory environment. Um, we are committed to mandating transition plans, and I know the Net Zero Council has been working on these roadmaps as, as well. Um, so we would mandate the UK-regulated financial institutions, including banks, asset managers, pension funds and insurers, and the FTSE 100 companies to develop and implement credible transition plans that align with the 1.5 degree 
goal. And again, lots of discussions going on as to how we can support businesses. Um, as I said, the Net Zero Council, as I understand it, has been discussing sector by sector roadmaps. Um, it's quite difficult from a position of, of not being in government and the civil service talks haven't really started yet to quite know how best to deliver on that. But I'd be very, as I said, I'm unfortunately I can't stay for questions, but certainly keen to hear people's feedback on how they feel the current machinery of government is working and what, what could be proved, improved. And I think we do need to look again, we shouldn't forget the smaller companies and the impact. It's one thing mandating transition plans for the big companies, but we know that if, they, if they're looking at their scope three emissions, that will inevitably have an impact on smaller companies that's in their supply chain. And we need to make sure that they're brought with us rather than um, just some winners and losers from, from that. As I've said, we need targeted public funding. Um, and I just would end by saying I think that positivity agenda and you know every conversation I have I see people that are absolutely committed to getting to net zero and it's not just you know there's there's an absolute imperative to uh, try to halt the rise of global warming and to keep 1.5 degrees alive we're very much at a tipping point whereas if we don't really raise our game in the next year or two um, it will almost be it wouldn't ever be too late to make to act but it will be that tipping point but it is also that presenting it to people as a massive opportunity this is our our economic future it's very much at the heart of our industrial strategy it could help regenerate deprived um, coastal areas areas that are are seeing the decline of their traditional energy intensive industries. And if that's one thing I, I hope comes out of a conference like this, is that this isn't a burden on the country, it is absolutely a massive opportunity and we've got to make sure we're at the forefront of it. So thank you.